Okay, good evening, everyone. Tonight's presentation, the Hydrogen Line Radio Telescope and Monarch Landing in Naperville, Illinois, will be given by Bob Bullock and Ron Selber. Fortunately, uh, Philip Schreiner will not be here. Uh, so, Bob Bullock grew up in Glen Ellen before Naperville had any traffic lights. He retired in 1999 and has been a resident of Monarch Landing and member of their astronomy club since 2013. He is an ASME Life member and has been granted 26 U.S. patents with one patent currently pending. Ron Selberg has been a Naperville resident since 1978 where he and his wife, Ellen, raised her two children. In 1977, he joined the TTX Company of Chicago, a company operating a pool of over 200,000 rail cars, where he retired in 2007 as their Assistant Vice President of Engineering and Research. He has been a co-recipient of 20 patents as part of his railroad work. Uh, so, uh, let's welcome Bob Bowen and Ron Silver. What we'd like to do is tell you uh, a little bit about the background of, of our club at Monarch Landing. It was founded about 13 years ago by Len, uh, Dr. Leonard Tuggy. He was a member of your group. Talk and I'll use this. Okay. <laughs> He was a member of our uh, of your uh, club for many years. I don't know if you remember him. He passed about two years ago. Uh, he was a missionary. He was the head missionary for the Baptist Church for uh, Southeast Asia. And he retired uh, to Wheaton and then to uh, Honor Planning. Our club decided to build a radio telescope about two years ago. Lynn had a six inch telescope, but we just couldn't use it because of the light pollution between uh, uh, Top Golf and our own parking lots. We just can't see the stars at night. Maybe the moon if we're lucky. Uh, Phil Schneider, Schneider uh, he was a uh, worked at Argonne as a research scientist. He uh, worked at uh, Lucent, and also he, he taught, he was assistant professor of physics. Um, we had about 30 members in our club, normally between 18 and 22 show up every Tuesday. They've been doing this number for oh, almost 13 years, every week. Um, a little over two years ago, I told Lynn Tuggy that I thought it was possible to build a, a radio telescope at Monarch Landing, and he gave me emailed me back that afternoon, saying, "Go ahead and try it. Let's you know, let's go for it." Uh, the next morning, security found him uh, passed away sitting at his desk, and uh, so it was. One of the last emails he ever sent, so it means a lot to us at Monarch Landing to have this telescope. Uh, so that's how I volunteered. Uh, Ron volunteered because his wife's a member of our club, and she volunteered him. <laughs> As you know, Octagon Telescope uh, looks at the stars with our feet firmly planted on the ground. Uh, the first telescope was you know, 414 years ago. Uh, of course, as you all know, you need dark night skies to make direct spectacular observations. However, again, the light pollution is terrible around here. Just coming in in the parking lot, you could barely see one or two stars with all the light out there. And it's also, you need clear skies. The advantage of uh, radio telescope, which is uh, actually almost this month, is 85 years old. Uh, the radio waves are clear, either during the day or night, cloudy or clear. It has no effect on the radio waves. At Monarch Landing, midnight comes around 9 p.m. <laughs> so we like to make our observations in the daytime, especially between uh, before lunch or after lunch, uh, lunch and dinner being the critical times. So. 
in your area, in the optical telescopes like us, bigger is always better. Here's the Hale telescope on the left, and this is the radio telescope down in Green, Bill, Green Bank, West Virginia. Now, the reason radio telescope works is because on this graph we're showing the electromagnetic waves, uh, infrared rays, ultraviolet visible light rays are all electromagnetic waves. Um, this is a uh, depiction, but it's a logarithmic scale. If this was a linear scale, this picture here would stretch from probably I-88 down to 75. <laughs> but thank goodness for logarithms so we can squeeze it down. The point I want to make here is, is that in the visible wavelength from near infrared up to ultraviolet, our atmosphere is almost completely clear. However, it's not 100% clear, and that's why you need to build these big ops observatories on a hill or a mountain. When we get down to the radio frequency, the, the sky, our atmosphere is completely uh, transparent. It's crystal clear. There's no interference whatsoever from about one centimeter wavelength down to about a hundred centimeter, I mean, hundred uh, meter wavelength. So uh, we'll get into it a little later. But if you look at the red lines touching the ground here, the second one to the left is about where the hydrogen is. The reason they, we use hydrogen, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. Every other element, hydrogen is the, was the precursor for everything else in the periodic table except lithium. But hydrogen, and fusion eventually and suns made everything up to iron and then from iron to the heavier elements they were created during supernovas or big explosions in the milky way alone we have three billion solar masses of hydrogen in the milky way and about 11, every 11 years 11 million years one of these little hydrogen ions will send out a little photon. Beep. This signal will penetrate forever and until it runs into something. In our case, it's going to run into our telescope. The hydrogen line frequency is fixed, measured by the Perot standards at 1.4204 gigahertz. Our telescope is accurate to actually seven significant figures. We had a bit of a learning curve over the past year and we've gotten better and better. Uh, next. One of the things that's very important in, in radial astronomy is knowing how far away something is. And like the signal that I was showing on the screen before as a screensaver, that signal was recorded last month and it was 750 million years old. So it's very important that we know the distance and the way we get the distance is used to the, the, the rate that the universe is expanding. We know how fast it expands per megaparsec. I'm sure you all know what parsec is. In astronomy, like other things, numbers get so crazy big that we have to invent new terms. And like parsecs, one parsec is about 3.3 thousand light years, so one megaparsel is at 3,300,000 light years. We measure the redshift by the shift of the frequency we see in our instrument. And knowing the, the difference in there and dividing that by the original frequency, we can get 
the redshift multiplied by this number, and then we know how, how far away it is in megaparsels. What is the hydrogen wave anyway? It's a radio wave that's, that uh, is discharged when the electron of a hydrogen atom flips. That is, when a hydrogen atom flips, it releases a photon. That photon channels about 300 million uh, meters per second, and it consists of two phenomena. It's uh, one of the four basic forces of nature, strong atomic, weak atomic, uh, gravity, and electromagnetic waves. The electron, the voltage, or the electrical part, it, it also creates a magnetic part of it, and they're just 90 degrees out of phase. Not out of phase, but 90, they work 90 degrees opposite each other. This is the last of the physics part <laughs> that uh, Phil should have done. The red is the neutron, the blue is the electron. They're, they're both spinning. Because they're spinning, they have a north pole and a south pole. So when the two poles, the north poles are pointing up, it has a certain energy state. However, once every uh, 11 million years, that electron will flip. So now, if you ever try to push two magnets together, north pole and north pole, you know it takes more energy. When you flip it, you have north pole and south pole, they, they come together. So that in the electron, that difference in energy is released as a photon at, the, at 1.4204 uh, gigahertz. Everybody understand? It's not a jump in, in an electron orbit. It's just the flipping of the electron from alignment to alignment south to pole to north pole. It's, all, it's just the flipping. And that occurs, the half-life is, like I say, about 11 million years. So you need a lot of hydrogen out there to get a signal. Radio astronomy really started in about 1932, 1933. Uh, Carl Jansky worked at Bell Labs in New Jersey, and because he had a medical condition, he wasn't all that strong, uh, they put him out in the countryside at the Bell Labs, uh, all the country, and they asked him, he was assigned a project to find out what, where the hissing noise was coming in radio communications between North America and Europe. So he was assigned to find out where that hissing noise is coming from and identify it. So he built this array of antennas. Uh, he used Model T wheels on a merry-go-round on a track. And he, and he uh, carefully, over a period of several years, measured the history of his signal coming in. What he found is that signal strength that he was receiving on his little merry-go-round were fixed in space. That is, every time his, he aligned his azimuth with a certain point in space, he got the same signal. And this was earth-shaking to him. Uh, this is kind of a plot that was made many years later of his data of constant signal versus, uh, I believe it's solar uh, the coordinates. The thing I want to point out, you can tell it's old because Cygnus A wasn't discovered until 1946, and so somebody in Cassiopeia A also had a high signal rate but he didn't know what they were, no one knew what the source was until about 1946. Jansky gave a paper 
It was published in 1933, and he read it at a conference. And he was so popular, only six people showed up. <laughs> what he did, though, what happened, though, is the New York Times was there. And they announced that radio signals had been discovered from extragalactic space, from outside of our solar system. In 1935, there was a young student at Armory Institute, now IIT. He uh, got a copy of uh, Chansky's paper, and it also intrigued him. When he graduated, he, he went to work for Stuart Warner Radio. <clears throat> Back in those days, Stuart Warner was in making console radios, which uh, Chansky worked for, so he had access to almost the, the latest electronics at that time. The reason I mention it, because mo modesty will not stop me, is that he grew up in Wheaton, went to IIT, and went to Stuart Warner for his first job. <clears throat> Someone else who you're looking at <laughs> grew up in Glen Ellen, went to IIT, and was recruited as first, my first job at Stuart and Warner in the same labs that Jansky uh, worked in. By then, electronics was gone. It was strictly mechanical gauges and speedometers. And I'm sure you all know if you have an old car, you've seen a Stuart Warner. Uh, instrument or on a bicycle. You've seen a Stuart Warner speedometer. Jansky was so interested, I mean, uh, Reber, Reber was so interested in it that he went, actually went to see Jansky for advice in, in how to build a receiver for this extragalactic radio signal that was coming in. And uh, Jansky told him that he had to stop all work <clears throat> on that project because Bell Labs told him that there's no profit in it <laughs> and to work on something that's profitable for the uh, company. So uh, when, Chance, when uh, Reber came back, he quit Stuart Warner in 1937 and started building this telescope. He built this uh, telescope in his mother's backyard. Uh, he ran the cable, and you see it right down, down the corner there, he ran it, the cable in through the coal chute into the, his mother's basement. When the neighbors started fussing about <clears throat> what he was building there, his mother told him she loved it because she could hang her laundry on it. <laughs> One of the things that Reber did is he thought, like everybody thought back then, is that the higher the frequency of the signal, the more energy it would have. That is like an electromagnetic spectrum. You know, if you go from X-rays to gamma rays to from red to blue, there's more energy coming through. So he started out, and he had a brand new vacuum tube from RCA that he <clears throat> probably acquired after midnight at Stuart Warner. <laughs> and he tried searching the heavens at a very short wavelength, at nine seminars would be around two gigahertz or two G as we use that signal on the phone. And he found nothing, nothing. So he went back, rebuilt his, his uh, receiver. His receiver up in the apex there it was simply a crystal a set, you know, a, a point on a crystal band, crystal sets, if you, anybody remember those, acts as a diode. And you could change the frequency by adjusting the size and the position of the crystal. So he went back down to 19 meters and then, and then uh, even longer. What he discovered, he got a very strong signal. What this meant 
is that these radio waves were not coming from hot bodies. It was not black body radiation. That is, the lower the wavelength, the more power was coming. So what he discovered, but never got credit for, is that he, he discovered that radio waves coming from intergalactic space are not from black body radiation. Therefore, they're not from a heat source. Therefore, they're not from suns or hot objects. They're coming from something else. This is uh, his receiver. I think this was a 1.9 or 160 megahertz receiver. You can see the tube in his amplifier that he built in his basement. And this is what he did. He was hard of hearing, so he used to judge the signal strength just by listening to it in the beginning and then plotting arbitrarily on his chart what it sounded like to him. It took him several years, and he had to do this like you optical people at night because during the daytime, the automobiles at that time threw out so much electrical energy, he, he couldn't receive, so he had to wait till everybody was in bed and to do his observations. So he slept there in the day, did his observations at night. And this is the plot he came up with at two different frequencies. And you can see there's high concentrations at certain spots in space. And he was very close to where we live. He was at uh, uh, latitude 42 degrees. We're at 41.5 or something like that here in Naperville. So we're looking at the same sky that Reaver did. So. This is another, just to show you, these are four calibration charts that came from Green Bank originally in uh, West Virginia. What this, these are log limit charts again because our numbers get so crazy we have to use logarithms to express them meaningfully. But on the horizontal cycle is frequency and for the various stars, Cygnus A, Cecilia A, Taurus A, Virgo A, as you go lower and lower in frequency, moving to the left, there's more and more energy coming in. And this is completely opposite from hot body radiation. Now the flux density is in Jack Jensky's, and that doesn't matter right now. I'll, I'll show you what that means later. But just know that flux density is so much energy per unit area that it's coming uh, through space at us. Next slide. But this was groundbreaking and you never got credit. The war came and with the came with the war, Jensky was kind of drafted to Washington and he had to work for the military and he worked on degaussing or demagnetizing warships as they traveled through the water they became magnetized because there was current all sorts of electrical currents that go through magnetized the steel and made the ships kind of easy to spot by submarines or, and so he his job during the war was to develop a, a method to meet uh, demagnetize warships after the war he was essentially the only radio astronomer around in the U.S. The U.S. spent all their dollars after the war on bomb manufacturing, the atom bomb, hydrogen, and, and fusion bomb. The radio engineers got no public funding and they fussed. What they fussed about is they kept saying radar, which they developed. Uh, won the war. The bomb just ended the war, but nothing was done. Now, in other countries like Australia and England and, and France and, and Germany and Europe, 
these big, huge radar antennas were left behind after the war. So in those countries, they started doing um, radio astronomy with them. They went back to um, Jansky and Reber's work and really developed it with these big antennas. Uh, it wasn't until the 50s that the United States realized that the, they were falling behind radio astronomy, and they got a committee together, and by the 60s, they started building Green Bank. Now, the big break that got the uh, U.S. interested in radio astronomy was work done at Harvard by Edward Purcell, and they called him Doc Ewan. Purcell uh, was pretty famous. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering the uh, magnetic properties of fluids. And that led to what we all know now as MRI uh, equipment. Doc Edwards was his assistant, and they designed, uh, based on the work of Reber, in 1946, a Russian predicted that there's a possibly this hydrogen line existed. So starting in about 48, by, but by 1950, they built this uh, radio receiver that would re receive what they thought was the 21 centimeter hydrogen line that our telescope now takes for granted. They made two mistakes. One, mis the first mistake is that when you have an unknown frequency and you're looking at noise, one of the tricks that was developed and was developed by a, a professor, Robert Dickey, at Harvard, also in 1946, in that in your signal that the radios come in, you introduce an oscillator of a known frequency and you switch this oscillator on and off, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand times a second. And this oscillator uh, keeps your radio from drifting away. It keeps it centered in the frequency range that you want to examine. Uh, in uh, 1951, it, <clears throat> it was commonly referred to as the Dickey switch because it was literally, you know, switching in this oscillator in and out. Well, they got the oscillator value wrong the first time they tried, and they got nothing. They couldn't get to the hydrogen line frequency. So Dr. Purcell, even though he's, they're both professors at Harvard, Harvard being the richest school in the United States with the largest endowment, wouldn't pay them to fix their oscillator. So uh, Purcell had to pull $500 out of his pocket, gave it to Doc Ewan, and they, they fixed the oscillator. It took him three months and $500 to fix it. I will be coming back to that shortly because we can do it now with a mouse click. <laughs> this is their horn. This is uh, the Doc up on his horn. This is coming out of the fourth floor window of the physics building at, at Harvard. And as you can see, it looks like it was designed by a Harvard PhD. <laughs> uh, the second problem they had is this is in March. If you notice, there's snow on the ground and there's a little bit of snow on the roof, you know, behind them. The second problem with operating this is the Harvard students thought it was good fun to throw snowballs into this hopper. You know, that was four stories high. <laughs> That's, that was the physics of it. It's a given wavelength emitted at a good, given frequency by the hydrogen atom. Now, why do we pick a, 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 a pyramidal horn shape. The advantage of this 
is you can get the most gain possible with this shape. Also, you can direct it to some degree. If the horn isn't pointing at the source, radio signals coming from other directions will not enter the horn. The horn is designed such that the frequency you're looking at comes in in a standing wave. And then as they come down the horn, they're reflected off the inner lining of the horn. And as the horn gets smaller and smaller, the frequency stays the same, the wavelength stays the same, but the energy increases because you're squeezing more and more of these photons together. Then finally, uh, the horn also protects us from other radio sources that try to enter the front of the horn. That is, the horn will not, it has about 12, uh, plus or minus 20% on the bandwidth, over the bandwidth that we designed it for. So anything outside of that won't, won't register in the horn. It just turns the heat and disappears and, into enthalpy. And the design is simple. Now what a standing wave is, people have asked me, a standing wave is a stationary wave that its amplitude is fixed in space. That's nothing more than, say, this girl on the swing, swinging to the same height each time. And I'm sure we've all done that at some time in our life. What these peaks on our, she reaches four and a half, are the amplitude of her swing. So she is actually, these amplitudes create a standing wave. And that's all we're saying is that the horn creates a standing wave at the frequency it was designed for. So. Now, I wasn't going to let you go without some math. <laughs> Taking the horn shape and applying the wave mechanics of, of radio waves into the, this horn shape, and after about eight pages of math, you come up with a characteristic equation for a horn. Solving this equation, which is a fourth degree um, polynomial, you can optimize it by many means. One of the easiest means is, of course, just graft it now on your computer. You have a series of graphs and pick up the high point in the curve and say, that's where I want to be, maximum gain. That works out to be, the maximum gain works out to be simply the A dimension, which is the width, divided by 0.45 times uh, the wavelength squared. Now, the A dimension, once you determine the A dimension, all the other dimensions, the width, or the height, and the focal distance, uh, the focal distance is the point from the front of the horn to the focal point inside the waveguide, is fixed. So the only thing that, the variable, the only independent variable you have in a horn design is, is the dimension that your local home improvement store you know, <laughs> will provide you in the material. <laughs> the waveguide is such that it, it, once the microwave enters it, it's in a standing wave, and it'll come in through the open end, get reflected back, get reflected back again from the incoming waves. And then we pick it up with a copper probe. It's, it's a quarter, one quarter length antenna. That is the length of the probe is one quarter inch of the 21 uh, centimeters wavelength. The, the um, waveguide we're really lucky in that a one gallon class F rectangular can is the perfect dimension 
for the hydrogen line frequency. It, I mean, it nails it perfectly right in the center. So that really, you, you see all sorts of designs of wave guides and welding aluminum and all that. All we're using is a, is a paint can. Next is yours. Well, well, I guess I'll take over for just a little bit. But as Bob described to you earlier, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion amongst the Astronomy Club at Monarch Landing um, coming up with the desire to actually attempt to build a radio telescope that we, the residents, could go and use and see if we could pick up some of the uh, hydrogen line radio frequencies. And uh, I think Bob was much more convinced than maybe I was when my wife brought this project to me when she said, oh, all our group wants you to do is build this trapezoidal horn telescope that can pick up radio waves at the hydrogen centerline frequency uh, that come into Naperville and into our property from about, what, a couple million or millions of light years away. And I said, you're, you're, you want me to build what? <laughs> So at any rate, uh, I happen to be a member of the woodshop, and we needed to use the woodshop facilities at Monarch Landing to attempt to build a uh, trapezoidal horn uh, radio telescope. And so I should say that Bob and I really have known each other for probably over 40 years. And we're both a couple of railroad engineers, actually. And uh, so this took us a little bit out of our specialty but I think uh, we both thought it would be a, certainly an interesting challenge. So when that subject was brought to me, we first made a, an initial radio telescope, which turned out to work, out of uh, four by eight sheet hardboard, uh, but it became kind of heavy and cumbersome to set up and, and aim properly to get the proper azimuth and elevation to see if we could pick up one of the targets that Bob has mentioned before. And so the one you're going to see here this evening is one made out of foam board that uh, was much easier to handle, much easier to set up, and uh, is actually collecting these radio waves quite successfully. It's amazing what it can do. So I guess I became a believer after seeing uh, what can be done and that you're going to see here tonight, uh, of building one of these things. So the actual dimensions of the telescope you're about to see, the radio telescope you're about to see, is that along the long edges, uh, that's about 91 inches, uh, the width across the opening, the large opening, is 51 and a half inches, the height uh, is 43 and one half inches, and the actual sides and top and bottom of the uh, horn is made from 25 psi pretty much standard insulating foam board that you can buy at Home Depot or Menards, things like that. Certainly we went online and, and as Bob said, others have built radio telescopes, but we didn't find one exactly like this. It turned out that a four by eight sheet of foam board just about exactly met the solution to that fourth order polynomial. And that turned out to be fortunate. So. So we didn't have to work too hard to actually come up with the dimensions that fit that polynomial, but it turned out uh, that it worked pretty good. So this is a picture of several of us. You see Bob there in the, toward the left of the screen. I'm kind of behind one of the sides of the foam board. It was, again, the purple kind of foam board if you're ever in Home Depot or Menards or Lowe's. Uh, it's a little more dense than the white foam board, so it, it worked a little bit better to cut it. And, and we had to, first of all, glue the tin foil that you see there, or the aluminum foil, to it. So as Bob was saying, it has to reflect the radio waves coming into the horn and direct them down, organize the radio waves down into the waveguide that you'll see here in a little bit. And we couldn't use any metal fasteners or any metal brackets or anything. It had to be all uh, put together with adhesive. So we used standard foam board type adhesive to do it. Here you see us trying to make sure we could get it square. And that, took, that was a little bit of a challenge to get these big pieces of foam board squared with each other. 
Uh, one of the challenges was is we built it in two halves, and you see one half here. Uh, in our wood shop, we have a little bit lower ceiling, and we had to store one half of it while we were putting the other half together. And in order to find a place to store it, we actually had to move one of the roof panels away so we could stick it up into the ceiling a little bit. And I should say one other critical thing about using a four by eight sheet of foam board, the other critical thing was we had to be sure we could get it out the doors. And to tell you the truth, we spent some time going through our facility to get it from the wood shop that's down on the very lower level so we could actually figure out a path to get it outside. And it was not just a straight path going out the, the simple door. We had to really think through how we were going to get it up in an elevator and, and out through the main entrance, which uh, eventually we were able to do that. Uh, here you see the completed horn with the waveguide down to the lower right of the screen. And what it's doing here is we're just balancing it, uh, looking for its center of gravity. You can kind of see the center of gravity located by that circle with the kind of dark colored quarters in the circle. And uh, it turns out that the center line on the foam board itself uh, was pretty good at allowing us to locate the center of things. And we just balanced the horn. The horn is just balancing its own, by its own weight plus the waveguide. So we could know where to put our high-tech pivot point, our universal joint that you'll see here in a minute. Very high technology, by the way. Uh, here it is. I guess our high-tech universal joint is better known as a bowling ball. And we weren't the first ones to think of that, by the way. There's, if you go and search, uh, a lot of telescope builders, not just radio telescopes, but other telescopes, and maybe you've done that, you'll see that bowling balls have been used in the past as counterbalances and in some cases uh, a pivot, uh, somewhat like you see here. And then, again, this was truly a do-it-yourself project. Uh, we had a surplus cabinet from one of the apartments where we live, and it turned out that made a perfect base, put some two-by-fours across the bottom and some casters, and it allowed us to have a door and a nice area to store things, like uh, some of the spare parts we needed uh, to operate the telescope, and a uh, long extension cord, some things like that. So it turned out, again, we uh, may have had the lowest cost radial telescope ever built, I think. Yes? Do you store your vacuum tubes in there? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, we can put our vacuum tubes in there, too, of course. <laughs> yes. So at any rate, uh, we kind of used the materials we had at hand, and uh, as Bob will tell you in a little bit, it turned out pretty good. Here we're doing our first test of elevating the radio telescope using that uh, bowling ball on the uh, shelving that was used as the base. I'm kind of hanging on here because that was the first time we elevated it to that extent and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Actually in one of the other times we did it, if I go back a little bit, I don't know if you could see it in this picture but there's a wood dial sticking up from the top of the bowling ball if you look carefully. Uh, that's in the thumb hole by the way. So if you're ever going to use a universal joint uh, that's made from a bowling ball, uh, key on the thumb hole. But it turned out the wood dial actually wasn't strong enough, so we had to change it out to uh, a metal rod. Even though the, the foam was pretty light, it still put enough force on that. We sheared it at one time. So at any rate, after exercising it, and it balanced really well, and it allowed us very simply to elevate it and of course by rotating the cabinet on the casters we could um, aim it at different azimuths so it turned out to be a rather simple system to set up. But that was not the secret. Uh, some of the microelectronics that are available today are amazing and I'm going to let Bob explain that a little bit more to you but recall the slides you just saw of what uh, Rope Grieber had to use when he was setting up his original experiments and the electronics uh, that Jansky was using and the people even at Harvard were using, it's nothing like what you have available today at a small fraction of the cost. So I'm going to let Bob describe it to you because it's rather amazing what you can do. Okay, here's the real key to radio telescope. The signals that are coming in so weak and so miscial, there's no way you can sense them directly. What we have here, the two black items are, are uh, amplifiers. 
each amplifier is increases the electrical signal 40 dB. That is the electrical signal in each unit increases the signal strength 10,000 times. The next one is again 40 dB. So now we're increasing the signal strength with two of them in series to, to uh, 10 to the eighth, which is uh, 10 million times, 100 million times, I'm sorry. Uh, the real key to it is, is we have to get the signal amplified in the shortest period length. Then we come to the radio receiver, and this receiver is software driven from the computer. And what it does, it does the tuning, and it converts the electrical signal into digital signal. Once it's digitized, then we can put a USB cable on it, and we can run it many, many feet to our computer. It's not so critical now with the digital signal coming through the system. This is our uh, way we use it now. This is outside one of our garage bays for a monarch landing bus. We're here, we're, we're pointing, we, we set the azimuth, and we set the elevation. We have to preset it, and then we turn on the recording and record it. You can see here, after climbing up our um, learning curve, we added two more amplifiers. One of the problems we have is this connection here, is, which is just duct tape. I mean, it's, um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, duct tape, aluminum duct tape. is holding the system together here. So we can't put much weight on this can. So, as quick as possible, we've got to increase the electrical signal enough to get it through a short cable into the rest of the amplifiers. So here we have one, two, three, four amplifiers, four times 40, that, that's 160 dB now. So now we're raising the uh, power, the gain, by 10 to the 16th power. Then it comes into the radio where it's digitized and then s sent to the computer through a USB cable to the, to the computer. We hold the thing in position simply by running these cargo straps down through some eyelets and just putting enough tension on it so we can set the elevation and it sticks there. Then, because <clears throat> some of us old guys stumble into it and knock it, we put a brace behind it so it doesn't move when we knock into it, but, or the wind blows. But and we were able to calibrate. The horn itself, due to its shape, gives us 22.2 dB gain. The Sawbird amps give us another 160 dB gain. The, computer itself has excellent uh, sensitivity down to uh, 100 dB. So the total gain from the, from the signal entering the horn until we see it on the computer screen is like 10 to the 28th power. Now, that works out to be 10 to the 28th, actually 0.2 watts per square meter that we can sense. Now, because we're, there's such crazy numbers. Uh, in 1971 or 1972, the International Standards Committee in France set a definition of one Jansky one Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 power watt per square meter. So you can see that we can measure down to maybe one one hundredth of, of a 
Chansky. Or if you want to print out all the 26 zeros, it's, <laughs> it's point 0.25 zeros one watt per square meter. I mean, the numbers get crazy, but it's very sensitive. To aim it, we use the Starman galaxy as we see it from Monarch Landing. Uh, we don't have any other alignment. We don't have any stars to align it by because it's daytime. Uh, our sun does, our telescope can't track. And that means our viewing session of looking at one particular target is very limited. We use a electronic level to level, uh, to get the altitude. We just use an iPhone to get the azimuth. We need the solver amps and receiver as hardware, a computer to uh, collect the digitalized data, and the, the high definition software to find out HD SDR is freeware that you can get on the internet. The Earth is moving at 15 degrees per hour. Our field of view is about a little over seven degrees. So that means our target will enter our view and leave it in about a half hour. What we do is when we set up our azimuth and altitude, we point in a certain direction. Then we turn the system on 15 minutes early and then let it record all the way through to 15 after when we figure the target is beyond our field of view. We use both Stellarium and the NASA IPAC Caltech database for targeting. Um, Stellarium uses J2000. That's updated every 50 years. Now it's 2022. So we found the better data targeting actually comes from NASA IPAC database. I'm sure you guys have used it too for targeting stars. This is uh, aerial view of Monarch Landing on the kind of the Lavender roof. That's where uh, about 400 and some seasoned citizens are having a ball, <laughs> spending their children's inheritance. <laughs> and then we're located away from all the electronic noise from radios and pacemakers and everything else over here in, in the other corner of the property. We actually have a wonderful facility here. If we can keep the buses out of the parking garage, out of the garage here, what with the buses out, we have just a beautiful uh, uh, facility here where we can sit in the shade or sit in the heat in the winter time and, and do our uh, recording. I'm going to show you an example of one recording. This is one we did last month, I, I think October 6th. We detected the hydrogen 21 centimeter line coming from Cygnus A. It's the brightest radio emission seen by both Jansky and Reber, if you remember all the way back to those graphs. It's given in, in the J2000 as right ascension declination. Then we use Stellarium to convert it to azimuth and elevation. You can't see it in the night sky, but you can see DNAV, which is part of Cygnus, or it's part of the Northern Cross, and it's very first magnitude star that you can easily target. Cygnus is kind of in the armpit of the uh, wing pit, I'm sorry, of the uh, swan. This is what Cygnus A looks like in radio waves that we're looking at, and also in X rays. X rays being blue, higher energy, uh, red being the radio waves. So. When we look at Cygnus A, we're, we're looking at the red area. Now, earlier I, I was showing you the screensaver with Cygnus A line coming in. What this is, is that we're, when we get the 
digitized signal into the computer, it's like trying to sit from a fire hose. I mean, there's so much data coming in. So we do two things. One, we do a, we send it through this program. It does a Fourier analysis. So it picks out the frequency, uh, amplitude frequency in the second chart. In the top of the chart is a waterfall, which is just a time history of the signal coming, coming into our data. We record the raw signal. We don't record the, uh, the final data. So earlier, this computer was actually doing the Fourier analysis rather than just showing you a video recording. Now, our recording uses about one gigabyte per minute. So with, with uh, 30 minutes of recording, we use 30 gigabytes of memory. Like on the top, the green line is the actual signal coming from the hydrogen atom at sigma A. This signal has been traveling 750 million years. In that 750 million years, it's passed through a lot of space. And some of that space has ions and you know, charged particles and who knows what else it's, it's passed through. So being 750 million years old, like some of us, it got a little wrinkled. <laughs> the second line here is actually the, the Fourier analysis on a frequency base, amplitude on a frequency base. So now we can measure precisely the, the decibel level that we're seeing here. And that, because Cygnus A has been so well studied by everybody, that gives us the means to calibrate our antenna. So we use this Cygnus A as the standard to, to calculate the gains that I just showed you earlier. The third line here is, is the signal within, see the little blue thing on the second line? That is spread out in the third line so we can analyze it also in the waterfall. And then the fourth line at the bottom is, is the Fourier analysis just within that little blue band. The last thing I want to point out is that this line here, this real sharp line, and you see the red line going up through that, that's, that's the fixed oscillator. And that fixed oscillator, we can tune just with the mouse by clicking on the numbers where it's, it says local oscillator, LOA. That's local oscillators. What we can do with a mouse click cost um, the Harvard people that Five hundred dollars to fix. So we've come a long ways. The uh, the center line and the focus line here, the the red line below here, reads out the frequency. So you can see that that's the frequency we're actually measured the the red tuning. So that's what we get now. The previous picture, where you saw all the x-rays and the radio waves and all that pretty color in the sky, took 27 radio antennas to produce that mosaic. We only have one, but we're working on two. We're going to re rebuild our, our original one, so we have two. Then we can link them together. We can link them together to get more precision and accuracy. Our goal is to, by doing that, is to decrease our, our field of view. Right now, uh, we're seven degrees, 7.2 degrees. Uh, to really get really good accuracy, we gotta get down to like one minute of a degree or less. So that takes a lot of antennas to do. Now, positioning two antennas, say, a mile apart, 
and then recording and combining their signal is the same thing as building an antenna a mile in diameter. So there's a lot of potential and fun things we can do in the future. Some of the things that we can do easily, we can uh, find the spin rate of the Milky Way, we can find the size of it, probably even make a rough calculation on how much dark matter is in the Milky Way. And one thing that kind of frustrates me, when you go into the NASA IPAC extragalactic database, there's a lot of data missing at the hydrogen line frequency because nobody's really interested in it much in it. Everybody's up in X-rays and gamma rays with their with, or, um, infrared waves that can't get the Earth. So on the Earth observations, there are a lot of blank spots in the flux density at the hydrogen frequency. So we figure it would be fun kind of to fill that out in the future. Finally, what I would like to do is that our club at Monarch Lining would invite, like to invite who's ever interested to an observation uh, at Monarch Lining. We would hold it at that bus garage. Uh, it would be midday in, in uh, November, uh, the rest of November. Uh, Galaxy M87 is perfectly positioned between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. So it's right, in, well, it's right at our lunchtime at Monarch Lane, but we maybe could sacrifice. <laughs> but this galaxy has been studied so many times. It's, it's a huge black hole in the center. It's, the black hole in the center is uh, 3,300 times larger than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. The event horizon of this black hole has, is about the same diameter as Pluto. So our entire solar system would fit inside the event horizon of M87. That's it. I hope you, I got your interest. Uh, any questions? Yes. Can you let us know when that uh, midday uh, thing is going on? Because I'd like to show up and say hi to Lee Merrick and some other people I've met there. Sure. Uh, I was going to work it out with your group here. You know, we're free. I mean, our, our schedules are kind of open over there, so it's whatever is convenient for you. But I'm just saying that uh, the universe makes it between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock really a great time for M87 any day during November and a little bit into December. So when did you finish the this form? Uh, what month or year? When did you finish? Yeah, when did you Great. finish building the? Oh, golly, uh, we had a bit of a learning curve. Like Ron said, we had a failure of that pin, and we broke a few cables. We had to learn about not having too long of of our RF cable between the antenna. So it's been a gradual a gradual climb up the learning curve. But I say since August or so, we, we really feel confident that we can say, this is the calibration. We're, we're, we're uh, I'd say maybe two standard deviations confident that we got the cal calibration. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. <laughs> Pardon? Just beautiful work. Oh. <laughs> uh, what kind of tolerances did you have to have on the horn, horn part? He can tell you what he wanted. I'll tell you what we really got. <laughs> what did you really get? The, I'll tell you the drawing had the dimensions to a thousandth of an inch. <laughs> I think I told you I came out of the railroad industry where if I was off by an inch and I needed to adjust it, 
and I couldn't do it with a one-pound hammer, I'd go get a two-pound hammer. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, you know, that is interesting because, as you saw, those dimensions are not trivial. Uh, that to get the maximum power, you really do have to get uh, the, the horn dimensions pretty accurate. So we did the best we could, and as I said, it's just fortunate that a four by eight sheet of foam board uh, makes it about as easy as you could get to get those dimensions just about right from making the horn that you saw and getting about the maximum gain we could get out of that kind of material. So we probably weren't accurate to a thousandth of an inch, but we tried to get within a fraction of an inch, a small fraction of an inch. Yes, sir. Aside from the obvious pride that you have in collecting the information, is it shared with anyone else? Is it put together in a vast database, or is this just for your own personal interest? We just, we have, a, for each observation we've made, we've made about 14, we just keep it to our, we have a data sheet, and reducing the data it, it's really laborious, so we, we really haven't published anything. It's just something we share as a fun project within our club. It's a good, the, it's a good object. Pardon? It's a good object. Yeah. Have it, it's fun. The hard part is, is we have so much, you saw that signal, how it jumps around. Well, we gotta get a number out of that. So when we get 30 minutes of recording of that signal coming. What we do is we have to go back, because we don't have the software or the knowledge or the background, to every 10 seconds we measure the frequency. <laughs> we measure the frequency and the gain, uh, the decibel reading. So we get a long table. We into Excel. Then we um, take the mean, and then we can calculate from the mean through Excel uh, uh, for standard deviation, and then, then we, can, we know what one, two, three, or four sigma is from that. But that takes a, a long time, because the government can do it automatically with their supercomputers, but we're just using a gaming computer to do it. Okay, thank you so much.